Hi, this is Dr. Ben Morrill. Welcome to episode six of Reptile Genetics Weekly. And this time we're trying a live stream for the very first time. Those of you that are on Instagram, um, unfortunately, you won't be able to see some of the stuff we're putting on the screen. So feel free to switch over. It'll be live on Facebook. And then after that, we will put this up on YouTube. So we're, we're kind of learning with the streaming. And so we're, uh, we'll see how this goes. But to be able to see everything we have on the screen live, you'd have to go to the, the Facebook feed. Um, but yeah, welcome to the show tonight. Um, be cool, fun to have people here live, and we'll do our best to be able to, to uh, see questions, answer questions. Um, like I said, we're learning, so we'll see. I'm in my 40s, so it might be a little bit much for me, but Kayla's here. She's younger, so she'll help. My best. <laughs> All righty. So the first thing we'll do is give you a, a weekly update like we always do at the beginning of these episodes as far as people who have sent uh, tests in for, for shed testing. And um, we are processing them now and starting a run and we will start getting results on Friday. So probably Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, we'll be sending results out, hopefully Monday at the latest. So if you've recently sent sheds in, um, they got here, let's see, probably Thursday was the last day, today being Monday. So last Thursday was probably the last day. Good evening, Craig. We got one comment up on the Facebook feed. <laughs> Hi, Craig. Um, so, so, yeah, Thursday was probably the last day. Uh, any, any sheds that got here on Thursday likely got into this run. Uh, but the cool thing about right now is we have um, money from – People, you know, purchasing tests, we've got money to do a lot more um, test design and test, testing the tests. So uh, develop, test development, I guess, would be the best way to say it. So we, uh, in the month of May and hopefully into June and maybe from then on, we'll be doing a run every week. So this Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we'll be sending results out. And then for the next at least three or four weeks after that, we'll likely do the same thing. So we'll be sending results out every week. Uh, let's see. We've got another question about hypo. I'm going to jump on this real quick. Teddy, so a few months back for hypo, would you be able to tell me about the old shed sample if she's a hypo without sending a new sample in? Um, so to this point, I have been um, saving most sheds that are coming in. And so if you sent uh, message me your... your uh, uh, morph market ID and stuff like that. I can see if it's still here. Um, but most of the time, what will happen is, with uh, these tests where you're paying for a single shed test or a panel, um, we will have to have you send another shed in for a test that's developed later. But the cool thing I can announce for the first time on here, uh, we are getting closer to have our identity test available for ball pythons. Oh, cool. And if you If you purchase that, what that does is we're actually sequencing the entire genome. Uh, it's at a, you know, not a really deep, super expensive um, sequencing, but it's deep enough that we should be able to give you results for, for all of the tests that we have. And then the cool thing with that is we have the data saved. So right now, when you, when you get a single test, we just have the information for that test. And then usually the, the shed and the DNA are going to get thrown away or they get, you know, put somewhere that's harder to find. So that's difficult for me to do that quickly for you. Um, but once we have this identity test going, you'd be able to pay for that once. And then we would have all that information. Then later, if a new if a new test is developed, you'd be able to, I don't know for sure how, if it will be like a, a monthly subscription and then you can check anytime you want or if it would be like a, another fee to check back in you know if we get a new test we get sunset and so you want to be able to see if it's set for sunset in six months or whatever um but yeah that that capability will be possible once we have this identity test going and we're getting close so yes good, good stuff and yeah, we've got several people on here asking questions i like it yeah. Um, awesome. So yeah, to kind of finish up the uh, the update, lots of test testing going, lots of uh, results going out. Um, most of the time, 
for these next at least three or four or five weeks, uh, you should be able to get results within about two weeks of when your shed is received here. Because it'll get to me about once a week, and then it takes about five to six days to do the run and the analysis. So if it gets to me, if you send it and it gets here right before we start a run, it'll be closer to a week. But if it gets here right after we started a run, then it'll be closer to two weeks. Good stuff. Oh, it looks like we had uh, Karen and Dave join us as well. Good to see you guys. Hey, hey. Yes. All this right. does make it a, a little more interesting having people interacting in real time. Yes, it does. Um, so do we want to move to our first talk topic or? Yeah, uh, let me, let me just now. shoot this one out there. Dark Cloud Reptiles. He says oh, yeah. people want to put an op auction up where proceeds go toward developing new tests. I want to donate some animals. That's something we could certainly do. Um, that, that's, a, oh. that's a good idea. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we'll have to think about that. Randy, if I remember right. Is that right, Randy? You have to let me know if I got that right. Um, but yeah, he's he sent in lots of sheds. Um, we've got some some fun stuff coming from sheds that the dark cloud reptiles have sent in. Um, but yeah, that that's a good way. Um, other ways people have asked, you know, to support. Obviously, the first way we're we're set up is to use money coming in from tests that we're doing to just turn the vast majority of that money is just going right back into developing more tests right now. Um, so that's the best way to support us. Um, we might do like a Patreon in the future. I don't know, but that's that's a great idea too. Be able to do some auctions. That would yeah. be good. It is expensive both in time and in and in money to get it all done. And and we're thankfully to a point now where we've scaled up. A lot of what we did the last six months was scaling up. It was just being able to run hundreds to thousands a week rather than, you know, dozens. And that requires different machines and different analysis. And so it took longer. I knew it was going to be difficult, but it uh, took longer than I thought. Um, question about, did we cover an update on DG? Um, yeah, that's very, very close. Uh, this week, I won't have additional data, but next, so a week from Friday, I'll have additional data again. And it's it's looking good, looking cool. There's something interesting about that. It's going to be fun to talk about um, a, <laughs> a reason why it's taken so dang long. Um, but yeah, I, I do think we've got that figured out and we're very, very close. So right now the test is 85% correct. And uh, hopefully a week from Friday, I can tell you we've got it closer to 99. Once it's at 99, we'll make that available um, through both Morph Market and Clutch. There's a potential that one or the other would make it available sooner than that, even at 85%. Um, but we'll we'll see. We're kind of leaving that up to them since it's going to require some explaining so, since it's different from the other morph tests. Uh, we don't have it at, you know, that almost 99, that almost 100 percent. So, um, yeah, Mary Hubbard says she's got a bunch of DG. I've heard that from a lot of people. <laughs> I think the DG test is going to be very helpful for for a lot of people. And I've definitely put a lot of time into that one. And it's it's just been extra difficult. The clown one that we did all ourselves at Rare Genetics Inc. That one went by real fast. That was an easy one. And DG was the second one we really wanted to do. And it's required a lot more work. <laughs> but we're getting it. We're on our way. Um, so the next thing that we wanted to cover in this live stream, um, we always want to bring to you the most current information about genetic testing. Um, and specifically in our case, so we can kind of lean on other industries like birds have done sex determination from from feathers for several years, like 20 years, 15, 20 years. Um, so there's a lot of things we could kind of learn from them and their experience and how that went. Um, but uh, some things, because we're working from a shed skin, that we are kind of learning for the first time. And uh, I'm going to shoot in here real quick for those of you that are on Instagram. Um, so I'm streaming from my phone on Instagram the same time we're, we're doing uh, Facebook on, uh, on the computer. And then when this is done, we'll put it on YouTube. So if you miss some of this, you want to be able to see all of it. Don't worry, we'll put it on YouTube, the full thing once this is done. And then if you're on Instagram and you here in a minute, we're going to start putting some pictures and videos and things up. So if you want to be able to see that live, you'll have to go to Facebook. Um, but then, like I said, once we post it to YouTube, you'll be able to see the whole thing with pictures and, and videos. 
But uh, so one thing that we've learned recently, um, there was uh, a customer that had 11 sheds sent in for colubrid sex determination. And don't let your eyes glaze over if you're not a colubrid person. This, this it potentially can affect any species that you're sending in. This is a, an important thing for us to learn. Um, so it happened to be some, some garter snake sheds. So she sent in 11 and uh, orig originally, and so we tested those and all of them came out female. And so whenever that happens, if we have a, you know, a decent sized group from somebody and we get a whole bunch of male or a whole bunch of female, we send a message to say, Hey, you know, are these random babies from a, a litter or a clutch or like, did you expect there to be female heavy or male heavy? And, you know, sometimes people do, they'll, they'll tell me, Oh yeah, these are, you know, 20, that I thought were female and, and I've been holding back and I just wanted to test them and any of them that were male, um, then, you know, I'll sell, but I expect most of these to be female. So I've had that happen fairly, fairly often over the last four or five years, we've been doing the sex determination, but we reached out to Katie and, uh, and that was clutch city clutches, right? Uh, yes. Katie, Katie Beckett at clutch city clutches. Yes. So Katie did an awesome job. Um, she jumped on it. She, she said, first of all, no, I didn't expect it to be male heavy or female heavy. Um, I expected this to be a mix. So we said, okay, definitely resend the sheds in. And, uh, she, she mentioned, you know, I've marked them. I keep them together. They're garter snakes. I, many keepers keep them, uh, together in, in cages. And I just mark them with a marker so that I can tell individuals apart. And so she was kind of worried, hey, you know, maybe that marker is, is messing up the test. So one of the, the two markers isn't working, you know, the PCR markers for male or for female um, in the PCR test. And, and, so, and this is very common in the garter snake community that are like a little bit of non-toxic paint, I believe, on the babies. Like you'll see, you see it a lot. So this is very common. Yeah. And I, I, was I'm I just I haven't ever kept colubra or uh, garter snakes. Uh, I guess garter snakes and water snakes. You said this is pretty common to keep together and to mm -hmm. mark individuals to tell them apart. Yep. So so she like I said, Katie was concerned that potentially that marker uh, being there could could mess up the reaction and make it so that the test results weren't correct. Um, one thing I was a little concerned about was. So with mammals, we know for sure that we're shedding cells all the time. So that's why, you know, you can get skin cells, a DNA sample from someone just being in a room because um, we're always losing cells which have DNA in them. And, but with reptiles, skin uh, snakes in particular in this case, um, I wouldn't expect them to leave very much DNA behind. So I would have expected if you have them in the same cages together, they're not necessarily going to uh, have cross-contamination. So like if you have a male in a cage with a female, I didn't necessarily think that there would be cross-contamination between the two. But, you know, since we had so many, had 11 females, you know, that, that was kind of a concern. And so we wanted to set up an experiment, two different experiments really, to be able to tell if the markers were the problem or if there was cross-contamination between individuals, or maybe she really did have 11, that's certainly possible. I've, I personally had a clutch of 10 ball pythons and all, all 10 of them were female. So those things, those kinds of things can happen. Um, so she, over a month or two, she collected sheds, uh, did a really, really good job, sent them in. She sent in markers like she has. She sent some sheds that had been marked, some that hadn't. And uh, while I'm talking here, we, we've got a, a picture of one of Katie's snakes and uh, Kayla will kind of go through and show you some other pretty garter snakes. So you don't have yeah. to just hear me drone on. You get to see some pretty pictures. So for those of you on Instagram, sorry, you just get to hear me talk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and um, as a side note, the rest of these pictures after this one are from uh, Tim Spuckler of Third Eye Herp. I just kind of raided his Facebook page because this man has the best garter snake pictures ever. So, And he was, cool enough, he was cool enough to say... That, he, that we could do cool that. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's got some awesome pictures. There's, yeah. there's one saying hi back. Um, exactly. so, so yeah, from, from all of the samples that Katie collected and like I said, did a beautiful job collecting and, and recording how they were collected and you know, whether there was paint or not, what color paint and, you know, whether they were housed together, all this kind of stuff. 
uh, we were able to tell conclusively that the paint definitely does not affect the test at all. Uh, but what is a possibility, especially I would imagine with species that are in a more wet environment, is there is some cross-contamination. And my guess is I would have to test this further, or maybe somebody else will take this and test it further. Um, be kind of a fun experiment for a graduate student somewhere. somewhere. But my guess is it's uh oh. Oh, did we did, did he freeze? Someone save him. <laughs> Give it a second. Sometimes this happens. It's either that or I'm the frozen one. Free him. Uh Instagram still there? Okay. There you are. Lost you. Welcome back. Yeah, no yeah, worries. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Welcome back. All right. So where was I at? Uh, you were talking about, last thing I heard was it might be a cool grad, like grad, oh, yeah. grad student experiment for testing yeah. this. My, my guess is it's, it's oral or cloacal secretions causing the cross contamination, not huh. really so much the, the skin itself. Cause like I said, the skin comes off in that, you know, one shed cycle. It's not continuously flaking off like it does in a mammal. So, so anyway, um, so we're going to change some of the wording for our, for our, for our testing specifically for sex determination colubrids, but even for morph tests, uh, I would say that if, if it were me sending in a shed, I would probably do my best to not have another animal in there with, with the animal I want to have tested for like two or three weeks before you send the shed in. And one other thing we've had happen was, uh, a clown was in with a pos het clown female and uh they're pretty sure that some of his shed came off while i was in there and the shed they sent in was part of his shed so it came out as a clown it, when it was a pos het clown female that clearly wasn't a clown and so that's another thing that oh, can no. happen yeah just yeah. gotta be careful think about it a little bit i uh, like be, like i said be, up to this point i wasn't really worried about cross contamination very much at all unless it was like an actual piece of shed like we just said um, but keep this in mind and like i said we'll change some of the wording and what we suggest to do when you collect sheds and part of that will be trying to make sure that you don't have another animal in with the animal that's going to be tested and that's especially important for people we get a lot of questions about whether it's okay to test the first shed. And before I've said the number one thing that you probably worry about testing that very first shed is if you're keeping, I, I know for me, when I have babies hatch out, I would keep them extra humid until they have that first shed. And so that humidity can degrade the DNA. But now another potential problem is if you have all those babies together until right before they're about to shed, then there's a, a possibility for some cross contamination. <laughs> I noticed on, I'm oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I noticed on the, that picture we had up before where it had all of the shed tests that Katie had meticulously written down. I noticed that it had musk samples on it. Like is, does it seem like there's something with Thamnosis, Tham, Thamnophis uh, or garter snake musk that seems to be doing this more often? Or is it just the cohab situation that's causing so we, that? So we did test the, uh, the chloe, so she kind of did a, a little bit of a popping motion and got any cloacal secretion that came out. She kind of dabbed that onto a paper towel. Give me some goo on a paper towel to run. Mm. Um, so one out of the seven, I believe, samples that she did that with, we got good DNA from, and it did come out male. Um, but the shed from that individual also came out male that time. So... Hmm. Seems like sometimes some cross contamination happens, other times it doesn't. So you know, it's we don't we don't know for sure, but we definitely want as soon as we understand something, we want to make sure that that people know that as you're preparing sheds to come in, to just have that in mind, especially if it's a species where it's you know housed together long term, and it's fairly humid in there. There's a chance for cloacal or, or oral secretions to get you know, spread between individuals. Um, and if they're breeding, obviously there would be some, some cloacal secretions being uh, exchanged. So we want to be especially careful during that time that there might be some cross-contamination. Makes sense. Cool. All right. So um, what else? Do we have anything else with the garter snakes? 
Um, I think that's it. Other than the pretty pictures so. from from Tim, yeah, yeah, those are They're awesome. So good. I think these are. <laughs> I think this is actually the last one. So good job. Wait, nope, one more. Uh, there we go. Nice Santa Cruz garter, looking angry. Love it. Um, we do have a couple questions uh, in the um, in the comments. Did you want to address those or wait until after the the main topic today? Time, especially if it has to do with this. Um. Let's see, one from Terry and one from Sam. I can, I think I can let's star those. Yeah, let's go ahead and answer them since we're live and yeah, we might be driving or about to drive or whatever. Let's let's answer them now. All right. So first one's from Terry Pruitt. Good evening, right. Doctor. With everyone getting excited about new morphs that need coding, are you taking in sheds to learn how to decode? I have enhancer combos. Would you uh, would like to push that out um, to also see if that helps with DG, if that works? Wait, wait, nudge, nudge. Yeah, so we have, if you go to our website, uh, we have, a, and actually if you go to our Instagram or our Facebook, we have a little screen recording showing this if you're on a mobile phone, um, what it looks like. But it, whether you're going on a computer or the mobile phone, if you go to our, our uh, menu, there's something that says help us. And there's a P.O. box to send to. And yeah, that would be great. Um, so far, the few enhancers I've run give me the same results as Desert Ghost. Um, but I've only run like a handful, like four or five. So, you know, if you want to send some more in, that would be great. The, if I get to where I've run 20 or 30, then I'll, then I'll have a really clear idea if it's, if it's identical and everything I've seen to Desert Ghost or if we can see some changes between the two and like I said, this Friday, I won't have new results on Desert Ghost, but the next one I will. And uh, I'm hoping by that point, I'll have a, have it nailed down really well. And then if I had some, some more enhancers to run, that'd be great. So yeah, so go to our website, go to the menu and help us. And that PO box is where you would send those. Oh, and here's a screen recording. Let's see if I can I remember you. how to point to it this time. Ha, I got it right this time. I always did it backwards. Oh, me too, okay. <laughs> so there yeah. There you go. It's there. Make it really easy for you to be able to send sheds in anytime. Um, when you go to this help us and send it to the Virginia PO box, that comes directly to me. And I make sure that that gets into a sequencing run so that we can uh, develop new tests. So yes, that would be great. And, and whether it's Desert Ghost Enhancer or another morph that you're interested in that we don't have yet, that'd be perfect. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, we actually have a question that was related to the garter snake, uh, question. If you wanted to do that, yep. I promise we're not, yep. not forgetting you, Sam. Uh, <laughs> this one was from Sean Christian. Uh, what about washing the neonates before they shed and separating them? Which I, I think we talked about in, uh, episode four, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely fine to wash them. And I think what Sean's saying, by the way, this is Sean, that those of you that have talked to Sean messaged Sean. Uh, this is the same one. So this is Sean in Texas. So the other PO box, when you send in a, a shed that you paid for, uh, Sean is the one that runs that. So what's up, Sean? Um, glad you can join us live. <laughs> um, so yeah, washing the shed. So the, we've certainly talked many times about moisture, wetness, humidity. That's not good for the shed, but that's completely fine when you collect the shed especially if you have debris, you know, sometimes you have cage debris, stuff like that. But in this case, with this cross contamination, it could decrease that some. That certainly could be a good thing to just, once you get the shed, take it over, run it under some, some water. I wouldn't use any, any uh, kind of um, chemicals, any kind of cleaning agent, soap or anything like that, but just running it under the water, using your fingers to just kind of, you know, get it as, as clean as you can. Um, that's not a problem. It's sitting wet. That's the problem. So if you want to take it over, give it a quick rinse and then set it somewhere to completely dry and let that get completely dried before you put it in a Ziploc bag or, or you can get it into an envelope and have the envelope in a dry room, let it completely dry in the envelope. Either of those things work really well. But yeah, that's a good point, Sean. That, that might help to, to get that washed, but just make sure it gets dried right away. As for the neonates themselves, um, I know that for a lot of garter keepers, um, they after they collect their neonates, a lot of times they'll be kind of dehydrated. So they'll put them in a bath together so they can swim around. And honestly, those are some of my favorite garter snake content uh, posts. Uh, would swimming all together in the same bath 
count as a wash or would that maybe risk uh, contamination as well? That would certainly be a really good way to provide cross-contamination. Uh, okay, so even after a, a group bath, maybe a single bath together or just washing the shed itself afterward, like you explained. If it's like right after they're born, correct me if I'm wrong or someone in the, in the chat, uh, with garter snakes, they take a while to shed, don't they? Isn't it like two or three weeks? Um, I'm not sure. With, with pythons, it's more like a week to 10 days. But I think I remember Katie saying it takes a little longer with the garters. So, you know, if you did it right after they were born and then you house them individually, then, you know, that should give them plenty of time to get that cleaned off. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, further testing okay. would be needed to know for sure. I, I would... If you really want to know what's going on genetically, I would definitely do your best to keep them separated until you get that shed sent off for testing. Then you can, you know, house them together. Or you can do whatever and not not be as worried about it. But that now now that we know that there is a possibility for some cross contamination, just keep that in mind. Good to know. Um, and next question is from Sam Fisher. He says, is there any way to figure out the less common morphs without hundreds of sheds being sent in? For example, the less common lines of azanthic, or is there no hope until there are tons of sheds available? Um, so if all you can get me is five sheds, then yeah, it's not really worth doing. If you can get me 10, especially if it's homozygous. So in the case with the less common azanthics, if you could get me 10, that's homozygous of that less common azanthic that's worth i would i would send that through and get it sequenced uh, that's worth me doing um we to may clarify, not uh 10 sheds from 10 different homozygous individuals right. not 10 sheds from the same snake yeah okay. exactly that, that's <laughs> a good point and sometimes i don't say that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it is 10 separate individuals so i would say that's kind of a starting point if you can get 10 separate individuals if at least half of them are homozygous. So if you sent me five, five new, you know, less common azanthics, and then five that are het for that, we have a chance. Um, much less than that would be pretty hard. And even if you do that, we might come back and say, hey, you know, it's just not giving us a clear signal. If you can get us 20, um, if they're 10, 10 homozygous, 10 hets, I would say chances are very good. We can come up with something we have a pretty good uh, uh, chance of getting there. Um, but it, it's really nice to have 30 to 40. And like with clown, we were able to do that really fast. We had like 60 or 70 and about half of them were clown, half of them were heck clown. And with that, I mean, that made it really easy, really fast. So definitely the more you can get us, the better. Uh, I would say 10, half being homozygous, half being heterozygous would be the lead. If, if I only have five, six, seven, I'm not going to send them the sequencing. It's just not worth it because mm -hmm. most likely we're not going to get anything. Um, but if you can get 20 to 30, then now we're starting to get to where we could be successful. Hmm. Um, cool. Do we have room for one more? Yeah. Uh, from Roger E. Gray, would you be able to show a new gene is not allelic with an existing known gene? I suppose if it's like, it's not allelic, but maybe don't have a test for it yet. Yeah. 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 So part of the mapping we do, uh, if, if a gene is not allelic, so if a, a new morph is not allelic, let's say something pops up that looks like yellow belly and asphalt and all of those. And you want to mm -hmm. know if it's also part of the yellow belly complex. If you have, you know, five to 10 to 20 of that, more different individuals that you can send in those sheds, um, we could map to the chromosome really quickly. Um, so that's Ooh. not that's not a big problem. So we could tell you, we might not be able to develop a test where we can say whether it's head or not, um, but we could tell you pretty quick. Um, yeah, that's on a completely different chromosome. So they're definitely not allelic. Or we could say, oh, the hits we get are right by yellow belly. So chances are good. It's, it's a yellow belly complex and we'd have to get more samples so we could zoom, zoom in and figure out exactly what that change is. Or if it's identical to one of the ones that we already have, obviously we could get that pretty quick just by running our yellow belly complex tests. Um, but yeah, we can That's definitely cool. tell you that. Nice. Um, and related to that, actually, in sending in individual sheds, 
uh, gray family snakes would like to ask, uh, does it matter if they're siblings? So it's best for, for, for the bioinformatics. So the part where we're trying to figure out, um, you know, where this morph is, we're taking these billions and billions of base pairs from animals that have the morph and animals that don't. Um, it's helpful for that software to have as much genetic variation as possible. So ideally, let's say there's 70 individuals of a new morph. Um, let's say it's a new, uh, less common line of azanthic. There's 70 individuals in the world. It would be nice for us to get 10 to 20 from that that are the most unrelated. That would be ideal. But we will take what we can get. So if, if uh, like, for example, um, with the new, like with uh, Monarch, we're in the middle of sequencing a whole bunch of those to develop a Monarch test right now. So my goal was to try to get samples from at least three or four different breeders. So I knew I would get some genetic variation. And then um, if somebody's giving me a whole bunch of them, I let them know, hey, if you can give me, if you've got 50 pied sheds, when we were, you know, testing out the pied test, which was a while, a way, a while back now. But um, if you've got 50 pieds and you want to help us validate and make sure this pied test works well, instead of giving me all 50, give me 10, but give me ones that are from different lines. So they're as unrelated as possible, because essentially what we're doing is checking the genetic variation within that breeder's population and making sure no matter what family these animals came from, our pie test would work on it. And so definitely if, if you can give us ones from different pairings, that's ideal. But, uh, you know, for something like, um, like Monsoon and Stranger, we're trying to get more sheds from them right now so that we have enough to get a, a good sequencing run going. Um, you know, we, we would take siblings and that's, that's completely fine. That still helps us. Good stuff. Thank you. All right. Uh, next segment. Yeah. Why don't you show them the video? We got a video for y'all. Okay. It was so, Mother's Day. This is Mother's Day themed. Yeah. Uh, and this is, uh, this one's for you, uh, Dave. <laughs> yeah. I think I Dave, have to say that in the most awkward way possible. I think Dave's still with us. So. Yeah. All right. This is one of the better surprises we've had this year. Look at the color on this. And it almost looks tri stripey. Hang on. Right there. What in the world? It's like orange dreamish. No, is that... it's not orange dream. It's too it's too late. Okay, well I wonder what she is then. Is that maybe Fire? Albino pied. No, 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 no. There's no. a lot of white there. Yeah, I don't think so though. Okay. All right, Kayla, show us the picture of what it turned out to be. That's what they were looking at. <laughs> <laughs> so they they were both kind of right. It wasn't technically an albino pied, but an albino lavender albino pied or a piebald lavender albino, mm -hmm. uh, not normal albino. So so this was really interesting and confusing because of what the pairing was, and uh, this was completely not expected. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so do we have a video where it talks about the pairing? Uh, actually, uh, I don't. I don't think Dave, I pulled one of the one of those Dave from Dave's tell, video. Dave can tell us what the the sire was. Yeah, uh, there were because there were the the dam was paired to a few different things, but this it, none of it was what they expected uh, yeah, yeah. when this clutch came out. So, so what ended up happening? Dave got this female. Um, let's see, is that the next video? We, no, we were going to show the babies next, huh? Yeah, why don't you show the, the, the video with the babies? Sounds good. So there were just four eggs in this clutch. And they're still in the egg. Yeah, I mean, the camera kind of picks it up. It's always better when they come out. Yeah, that's really nice. I mean, there are some albinos that are really, really that dark. Is typical, though. And then that one's a little lighter. Yeah. And that one's a little lighter. But this one, and like I said, I just showed you that girl. She's pretty bright. Okay. All right. And is the next thing we have the, the video with the female? Yes. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay. And then we'll talk. And then we'll talk. And any of you, once again, that are watching on Instagram, if 
you want to see the videos and pictures live, you'll have to go to Facebook. We'll, we'll see if we can get it so we can stream on Instagram as well. So unfortunately for you all, all you get to see is me, but um, we'll, we'll work on this so we can get it live streamed everywhere if, if that's possible. And then any of you that are wondering when this is done, we are going to post this on YouTube uh, the, mm -hmm. in its entirety so you can see pictures and videos. But All right, Kayla, go ahead. All right. Almost like a special or something. I don't know. And there's her potential tracks. So, so let's like, see. I don't know. We'll, we'll take a look at Big Gander. So it looked like she had pied tracks, but other than that, that's kind of, they her uh, genetics were a mystery. Yeah. Yeah, so he, he says in the comments here, um, this is part of some animals from the debunked Black Ball Red Ball project, which I won't go into here. That was some drama a few years back that many of you watching are probably aware of. Um, so anyway, this is some some animals from that. And given the pied marker, that that kind of striping on the last little bit towards the, the cloaca, that's uh, something that's very common in het pieds. Um, so that kind of gave him an idea maybe this girl was het pied but he you know just had it as a normal and certainly didn't know for sure what he's going to get so he, he did put in the in the comments here he said i paired her with a pastel blackhead het pied so we've got pastel blackhead het pied and then a female that you know potentially is a het pied don't know for sure um, but there's no albino at all in the pairing or lavender albino or ultramel or any of those things that they knew of and so having these babies come out looking like albinos or lavender albinos uh, definitely is a little mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. So so the, the reason why we're saying this is Mother's Day related is what Dave come to find out is that this is a parthenogenetic clutch or parthenogenesis occurred. And so what happens is in in reptiles, this this isn't. A possibility in mammals. In mammals, if parthenogenesis happens early in embryonic development, that embryo dies. You can't have a, a living parthenogenetic or parthen, parthen, parthenogen, <laughs> however you want to say it, uh, from Parto. a mammal. <laughs> a partho baby um, isn't possible because of Im, um, imprinting several things that are different with, with mammalian genetics. Uh, but with reptiles, amphibians, some of these other species, fish, um, you can. And then if you get into plants, there's even weirder stuff with polyploidy and different things. Um, but with reptiles, what can happen is the female, as she has follicles developing, instead of having, so we have half the genetics to make a baby in each egg, and then half the genetics to make a baby in each sperm, the sperm and egg meet, and that makes a full genome. You have a full set of copies from the mom, a full set of copies from the dad. Well, what happens with parthenogenesis in pythons, and it seems like it's similar in boas as well, but it's different in colubrids and venomous snakes, which we can talk about another time. It's a little yeah. different um, because pythons and boas are XY sex chromosomes, whereas the venomous snakes and colubrids are ZW. So that's why there's some difference in, in what you get. So with pythons, what happens is that the female, those eggs, instead of getting fertilized by a sperm, what happens is that one set of copies um, doubles. So you get a full genome, but your homozygous for everything that that egg happened to have. So in the case with this female, if she is indeed a het pied because she has those pied markers, half of her parthenogenetic offspring would be pieds and half of her parthenogenetic offspring would be normal. You couldn't get a het pied from her because what happens is whatever's in that egg, which is one set of the genes, one set of all of the chromosomes doubles. That's why you can't get a het from a parthenogenetic baby, from a partho baby. It can't be het for something. It's going to be pied or normal. All or nothing. Yes. And then because the sex chromosomes are X, y, or, yeah, X, Y, and it's a female, and females have XX chromosomes, so all of her eggs are going to have an X in them. And when it doubles, it makes an XX. So any partho baby is going to be a female. 
So first of all, as, as I believe happened, which Dave jump in, if it's any different, um, he noticed that those babies that were albino looking were all female. Um, another thing that he mentions in the video is that he did lose an egg along the way. And with partho clutches, that's really common that, that some of the eggs will go bad because it's like ultimate inbreeding. Like you're taking half of the genome, doubling it. So it's homozygous for like almost everything, <laughs> pretty much everything. And so that's certainly not ideal for, for having a, a good, healthy life. And so lost an egg. And you have some come out albino and pied when you didn't even, you know, know that the female had anything in her. You knew the male didn't have any albino or lavender albino in him. And so that those are all signs. Hey, you know, this is maybe a partho clutch. And so for those babies, that's why these it's a super mother's day for, for that mom, because there's no dad. <laughs> all they have is mom. And all the genetics came from her. And so it's it's kind of nice as a rule of thumb, kind of have in mind as you're breeding, if you see something come out that you don't expect, and if it's a python uh, or a boa, if it's female, if you had some, some problems during incubation, lost some eggs, when they're born, you see some weird stuff. Like I had a partho clutch once, uh, it was a partial partho clutch. So some of them are partho, some of them are sex, you know, genetic, um, you know, normal sexual reproduction. Um, but the one that was a partho, had really messed up egg sac and like umbilicus and stuff like that it was really weird. She did end up living. She did end up, you know, doing okay. Um, but, but she definitely didn't look normal in the egg. So, so that's really common when you have partho clutches and then anything coming out that, you know, didn't come from the dad and had to have come from the mom and it comes out homozygous from the mom. Those are all, all uh, signs that you've got a partho clutch. Yeah. And that was the answer from uh, Dave about the clutch. Yeah, all were female. One lab albino pied, two. And then the one normal, mm -hmm. you know, that, it could have been from sexual reproduction or from partho. But if it was female also, certainly could be partho. And then that one egg that one came from wasn't het for pied, wasn't het for lab. So pretty cool. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, did we want to show what happened when we tested her, the partho yeah. dam? Yep. So Dave did send in, and I believe um, he sent in um, uh, oh, the sheds yeah. from the babies as well. Yeah. So, yeah, here's her test results. Ta-da! So she did indeed test out het for pied and het for lavender albino. So he thought he had a normal that maybe was het pied that ended up being a, a double het for dreamsicle. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, let's see, actually, we have a couple partho related questions. Um, so, for example, Dave is asking, are partho ba babies still fertile? So uh, the best information on this in pythons and boas is um, uh, there's some publications from Dr. Warren Booth. And so he's done a lot, especially in boas, some with ball pythons, pythons in general. Um, I would say that the fertility is extremely reduced. I would say that reproduction is not as good with partho babies uh, because like I said, they're homozygous for everything. So if you're worried at all about inbreeding depression and when you have inbreeding depression, one of the first things that goes is your reproductive output. And hmm. so with partho, you've essentially made an extremely inbred animal because it's doubling of one egg, um, the genetics in that one egg. So they can reproduce sometimes, um, but I would say that if you randomly chose a partho female, uh, a female uh, from parthenogenetic reproduction and a sexually reproduced female, and then you kept them for 20 years and bred them each year, you're going to get more babies from the sexually produced animal than from the partho produced animal. And you may not even, you may not even get any from the partho. It depends on what they're homozygous for. Some some mutations are lethal when you're homozygous. So if that animal happens to get that, like that egg that he lost, um, probably had a, a mutation that when it was homozygous caused the that fetus that you know, embryo to abort. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gray family snakes wants to know: um, Can a clutch be partial part though, um, or would that be even more super rare? 
In my experience, the few people that, that I know, um, I would say it happens just as often, maybe more often, um, but I'm going off of just like four or five clutches that either I produced or people I know personally produced. Um, so yeah, I would say that it's very common that you have, like for me, I had three or four babies. I had two or three eggs go bad. I had three or four babies and just one of them was a partho baby. Um, and the other two or three were, were sexually produced. And I, I knew that from the genetics of the parents. Um, so it was pretty easy to, to know in that case, but yeah, there's definitely some, some of both. And I have to say to Chad, Chad, um, he says, looking good, doc. Thanks. You're very kind. <laughs> hey. I, I look forward to playing in the lab with you again. I, I will make it out to Texas again. Sean's trying to make it happen whenever we can. So we, yeah. we will do that. And uh, you can see me in person. You're looking good too, Chad. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, we have one more question from Dave. And then there's, uh, let's see, a general question from Zach Runyon and a Pretty cool story from Karen Cromer. Cr Cromer or Cromer? I hope I'm pronouncing one of those right. Um, um, why don't you do the, uh, so Dave has a couple of comments there before we move off of this. Mm -hmm. So he says that he, Dave says that he did send in the shed from the dam, the sire, sus suspected sire, which obviously ended up not siring the babies and one hatchling. Mm -hmm. And then he says, so is it possible the dream sickle female I held back may never be fertile or build follicles? That's certainly possible. I would say it is for sure less likely that she would reproduce than a sexually produced female. Um, but to say never, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that Warren Booth has gotten some, some offspring from partho produced animals, um, mm -hmm. but it, it is more difficult. So yeah. uh, I, I feel like if I were in, in your shoes, I'd, I'd give it a shot just to see. Uh, especially if you can like alter to ultrasound before her breeding season to see if like she is building follicles, you know, yeah. before pairing her up. Yeah, if you I have mean, that ability. If she happened to get in that one egg, all, you know, good genes, good, good mutations that are, you know, su they're successful for life. Then she doubled that. She's fine. But the, the problem you run into, and that's why we have sexual reproduction. That's why it evolved. Uh, for these kind of what we call the more complex species is because uh, you have so much genetic variation. And so that kind of makes it less likely you're going to have um, things pop up genetically that will cause an individual to either abort or to not thrive. And so that's why sexual reproduction is so good, especially in a changing environment. It gives you an opportunity as, as a species to kind of test out other things to see what might be more successful in a given environment. If things warm up or cool down, if you're an asexual species, you're not going to be able to adjust to those changes. Whereas a sexual species has a chance because you have that a lot more genetic variation. And so, yeah, I, like I said, I would never say never, but I would for sure say it's less likely that you'll get good eggs from a partho female than from a sexually produced female. Mm -hmm. Good All to right. know. Let's go to the one that, that you were saying, Kayla. Uh, let's see. Uh, Karen's story. Yeah. Which I think it may be partho related. So the story is, I have a strange story. I had a bamboo, a bamboo Mojave allelic combo, female bred to a chocolate hypo pastel. So all the babies should have been either Mojave or bamboo. She laid six eggs that hatched, two bamboo, three Mojave, and one chocolate male, which should not have been possible. Is there an explanation for this? So, I mean, one explanation is it was just a real, I've, I've had some Mojave's myself. I, the very first Mojave I bought was in about 06 or 07. I paid like $9,000 for <laughs> I've been breeding Mojave's for a while. Um, I've definitely had some Mojave's that were pretty watered down. They were difficult to tell the difference between the Mojave and a normal, which kind of sounds weird because most Mojave's are pretty obvious. I would say that's the most likely explanation is that it's still a chocolate Mojave, but just, you know, not the, the best, you know, expression of Mojave. Um, otherwise, you know, I, it, it would be difficult to explain. There are some other strange things that can happen 
My bad. Um, Didn't mean to pull it down. There we go. Let's see. And then the chocolate was coming from the dad's side, right? So yeah. Um, there are times where you can have just genetics from the sire end up in an offspring, but that's very complicated and very weird and very, what? very uh, low, low probability. Um, if you happen to have that animal around and can send that shed in, I'd love to run it and see if it looks like it is a, like a, I think it's a androgenesis instead of parthogenesis. It's androgenesis if it's coming from the male side. Um, I didn't but, realize that was a thing. Oh my gosh. And that's <laughs> super rare. And I, I definitely. Yeah. Oh no. Did we lose him? Yeah. We might've lost him again. That or you guys lost me. Um, <laughs> lost it for a second there. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're good. Welcome. So, back. Yeah, there, there are a lot of things that, you know, the vast majority of the time happen a certain way, but then there's always going to be these little exceptions or something weird happens. Um, but yeah. That's a that's an interesting one. Yeah, um, uh, we have a question from uh, Zach Runyon as well, uh, which is a more general question. So, oh gosh, where did I lose it? There we go. What is the general wait time on a shed test? So right now, uh, we we did talk about this a little bit at the beginning, and so Zach, in the future, anytime, like if you send a shed in and you're wondering. Um, first of all, you can check either on Clutch or Morph Market, wherever you submitted it, and you can see when we receive your shed. So that's the first bit of information that's good for you to know, because obviously we can't control the, the mail system. And I was doing this testing before COVID and since. And before COVID, out of 100, most of the time, I would not have a single one get lost or get delayed. Most of the time, no matter where it was in the country, I would get it in two to five days, business days, you know, days where the post office is running. Um, once COVID hit, I would say about three out of a hundred uh, would take three weeks or more. And then every once in a while, they just never got here. I had some Aww. since COVID where like a month later, the person would say, hey, it just got back to me. <laughs> it got returned. It took all this time. Um, can I send it again? So, you know, since COVID, it's, it's, more likely, but it's still not a lot. So obviously we can't control that, but as long as your shed says received by us, then uh, during May, and hopefully we'll be able to continue it through. We have enough sheds coming through that we can keep doing this. Um, but we, we hope to have, once the shed says received, within two weeks, you'll have results. And that's because we're doing a lot of research and development runs right now over the next four weeks, at least. And like I said, if we keep have it really, as many tests as we sell, the more tests we sell to people to help people with their breeding, that's more money that we can then just turn around and, and develop new tests. So, so, uh, and then we do these testing in batches. So we need to get so many sheds built up before we can do a run and have it be uh, cost effective. And right now, since we're doing so many research and development tests, because we've had you know you all buying tests, so we have the money to do more test more development testing, um, which is awesome. That's a lot of fun and will give us some more tests, but, uh, but yeah, so right now we're doing lots of that. And so the batches are going to be going through every week. And so if your shed gets to us right when we're about to send it off, it'll probably be about a week and you'll get your results. If it gets to us right after we send it off, to get sequence, then it'll be closer to two weeks. Um, but that is going to vary over time. And so this, uh, YouTube show that we're doing in the first couple of minutes, you know, minute or two of each episode, we're going to go over that every single week and let you know when the next results are coming out. So that's another great way to, to check. But if, like I said, if you just sent some in, then you're going to be able to see your results here in the next week or two after you sent, after it says shed received. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Okay, I think that might be it. Um, I think Gray Family Snakes wanted to know a little bit more about androgenesis, but uh, did you want to talk about that this episode or maybe save it for a future topic? Or I honestly don't know much about it. Um, ah, okay. it it's very rare and mm -hmm. it's very weird. And uh, I don't know. I, I personally don't know of any examples in reptiles where it's like fully proven through. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing Gray Family Snakes was saying was retained sperm. Um, in that case, where the female is a bamboo. With regards to this story, uh, Karen's yeah, story. Bamboo yeah, bamboo Mojave. 
um, since the female is a bamboo Mojave, the retained retained sperm doesn't really answer that. And, and maybe I'm maybe I'm miss. Uh, you know, feel free to jump in, Gray Family Snakes, if I'm not saying this right. If this isn't what you're asking, but if it is what you're asking, um, since the female, every baby should be either a bamboo or a Mojave. If one comes out and it's just uh, a chocolate, then yeah, yeah, you said you figured that out. <laughs> so yeah, you know, in that case, it's it's weird because from that female, it doesn't matter who the dad is, or if it's partho, should have at least a bamboo or a Mojave. And then if it's a partho, you would get a super bamboo or a super Mojave. So if that if that female in that case ever has partho babies, they should be white snakes every single time because there's no normal allele there. There's either bamboo or or Mojave. So every partho baby would be a female white snake. So that's kind of interesting too. That's cool. All right, sweet. Uh, I don't know, do we have any um, any other questions from uh, the folks that are still here with us? Um, I can look really quick. So Snake Morph, Snake Morph mm -hmm. one on the Instagram feed, he says Ooh, yeah. he has had partial, partial partho clutches and um, another clutch, only one full term was partho. And I oh. remember Snake Morph's one, I remember him saying he's got uh, some females that seem to habitually have at least some partho babies in their clutches. Hmm. Uh, let's see if there's anything in the quick scan. Yeah. I'll check on my end too. So here's a good question from May Reptiles on Instagram. It says, I'm planning on sending some sheds in soon. Would it be best to include a note with the unmapped genes so you can use it for research as well? Yes. And even, even genes that we've already mapped, um, it's good to include those. Because sometimes if there's something weird with a run, we might run your shed for, like, if you send it in for clown, we might end up running it for pied as well. If you said that you know it's a pied or you know it's a het pied, we might run it for something else too, just to make sure there wasn't a mix up or something like that. So I understand some people don't want to give more information about their animals and that's totally fine. Uh, but if you don't mind sharing information, if you let us know as much about them, if you let us know what sex they are, because if there's a shed mix up or some question, we can do a sex determination test and, if you said this is from a, a male that's posset clown, but we get results back, said it's a female, and we know, okay, there's a shed mix up on one end or the other. So that helps us solve that really quickly. So we have a lot of things in place to be able to solve if we have any kind of a mix up or question. And so the more information we know about your shed, the faster we can get your final results to you if there's any kind of question at all about anything. So but uh, specifically with the unmapped genes, that is awesome. Yes, definitely. That helps us because we do literally go through and we'll do a search and we'll pull sheds like, uh, you know, they could be sunset sheds or, you know, like I said a little earlier on, if it's um, stranger or, or um, monsoon, you know, if people have written that in, you know, we'll, we'll pull those and then we'll, we'll send those for whole genome sequencing and comparisons and all that stuff. So, so that does literally help us get more tests developed for you all to be able to use. So Terry Pruitt says you would have to pinky promise your silence then. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I'm pretty good about not sharing information. I, I treat this the same as if I was a human doctor that's legally bound to, to not talk. And, you know, unless people tell me, just like Dave was cool about letting us use his, his video, we certainly asked him beforehand. Mm -hmm. And Tim letting us use pictures earlier, we asked him. Um, we, we appreciate it. And like I said, whenever people are willing to, to share information, uh, we, we love that. That helps us be able to offer more to you all. Um, Dave Hensler says, I do that all the time. I label my baggie with all known genes, incomplete dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous. Awesome. That's perfect. Whether it's a recessive gene or an incomplete dominant, whatever, the more information you tell us, the more we can do with that shed. And like I said, that helps us get numbers when we're trying to develop new tests. That gets more new tests to you that have choices and availability later. So that's, that's awesome. We appreciate it. 
Sweet. Uh, what else do we got? Oh, and we just hit an hour. Look at us go. All right. Yeah. Well, I think I'm not seeing any others. Yeah, same here. By the way. All right. Then, Lots of uh, people in the Instagram, too. Sorry, you all only get to look at me. <laughs> Maybe you're just listening. Hopefully you're not just staring at me this whole time. That's that's not <laughs> um, They're admiring yeah. your beard. Yeah. It's hefty, yeah. you know. Hopefully good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe Erica got some some curls going on. Some, yeah, um, need, to, need to cool down some, but but yeah, we'll uh, we'll see. I don't know for sure how we'll do Instagram, uh, or maybe some of you know. Let us know if there's a way to to stream to Instagram and Facebook. We're using Streamyard. If there's a way to to stream to Instagram at the same time, so you all get to see the pictures and videos uh, live. We just didn't know how to do that this first time, and and then YouTube. Mm -hmm. We found out last minute yeah. that you have to ask for permission to live stream 24 hours before the first time you live stream. Yeah, so which we, was great to find out at five o'clock yeah. today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess we'll live stream to Facebook. That was the only one we knew how to do. And then I figured, well, I'll just turn my phone on. We'll live stream on Instagram and we'll let people listen. To, yeah, yeah. And, you, and then, as we said a couple of times during this, uh, when, when we... Um, when we're done with this, we'll upload the thing in its entirety on on YouTube. So you'll be able to watch it later and see the parts you missed earlier on. Yep. But yeah, it's been fun. Uh, it seems like we've had lots of interest. So maybe we'll try to figure out how to do it this way again. I don't know if we'll do it every week live, but maybe some of the times getting yeah. some some hand claps and things. Thank you. We we appreciate it. It's, it's fun you seeing seeing y'all on here and a lot of you I've I recognize your names and, and uh, mm -hmm. Same. really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, in, if you aren't already, make sure you, uh, um, you know, like and subscribe here on YouTube or Instagram or all of the above. It really helps us out. Um, and also, like, give us feedback. If you like the live stream format, let us know. If you prefer the pre-recorded video um, with, like, you know, where we set up the Q&As all transcribe from questions you guys sent before let us know um this is of course more long form uh since we're here at about an hour but just uh just let us know we were thinking there's no way we'll go a whole hour but that went by really fast surprise <laughs> <laughs> yeah well good good to hear dave appreciate he says appreciate all the help and conversations yeah. uh karen krumer says the desert ghost update should be live <laughs> yes we'll, we'll have to do that yeah so over the next two months i'm hoping we'll have four or five um four or five new recessive tests available these next two months we're yeah. i'm really gonna have my nose to the grindstone really pushing through the last little bit of several of these so Desert Ghost being the one I've spent the most time on. <laughs> yeah, I think for all the bio, ball python tests, that's the one. That's it, it's like the chondro sex determination test, but of ball yeah, pythons. Yeah. <laughs> the other one I've spent a lot of time on, and I don't have it working yet. Yeah, we'll get we'll there. Be working. Yeah, yep. you all have made it possible for me to quit my my other job, so I can focus on reptiles more. So these next few months will be. Uh, a lot more velocity, a lot more focus on on the, the reptile test, which is pretty fun. Awesome. Genetic stripe, monarch, sunset, yep. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I haven't really talked about it much, but puzzle, puzzle, yes. Uh, puzzle's coming. Um, API Xanthic, TSK Xanthic. Um, so, yeah, lots of really good stuff coming. Sweet. Yeah. All right, so outro time, maybe? I think so. Thanks again so, for watching. All right, thanks, guys. See you next time. Outro in three, two, one.